The scripture today comes to us from the book of Genesis, and it's chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and then verses 15 through 16, if you're following along with us at home. This is about the story of Abram. When Abram was 99 years old, God appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. All this God said to Abraham. As for your wife, Sari, you shall not call her Sari, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she will give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. May God bless and challenge us in the reading of this word. Ooh, have a little faith, little faith. Wouldn't it be nice to have just a little faith when we need it? Or better yet, when we want it. <laughs> so many times it feels like maybe we're being led to do something. We get this feeling to step out or step into something or step up to something. And wouldn't it be so tough to do if we could just have a little bit more confidence, a little bit more courage, a little bit more faith. And not for nothing. Seeing what the future looks like if and when we say yes to God, that would be good too. Nobody likes uncertainty. We like to know what we know, what we know, before we make a move. Amen? Are you guys here? You're here, right? <laughs> so we've been in this series called Fishing Tips, which is just a fun way to look at discipleship. We anglers, as we're calling ourselves, which is a fishing term for fisher people, anglers. We anglers, we've looked inward the first week. We recognize the need to work at seeing ourselves as being loved unconditionally by God, accepted just as we are, righteous, holy, called. Yes? And then we looked at what we're called to as disciples. As disciples, we're called to be listeners, to hear people, to hear their problems, to meet them where they are, to hear what they need, and then to provide healing as we can. But how do we actually step into that call? How do we live out that call to be fishers of people, as Jesus asks? How do we know when and where, how and who to cast that line? Now in fly fishing, as you saw during the meditation thought, there are two different kinds of casting, two different methods, sight casting and blind casting. Any fisher people in the congregation today? Barry, great. So if I mess up, just let me know. Sight casting is when you see the fish in the water ahead of you. It's clear weather, it's a nice blue sky. Most of the time it's clear enough to know where the fish are running and you cast your line accordingly. You know where to cast your line. It's the picture of fishing that lures would-be fishers to try casting for the first time. See what I did there with lures? Blind casting, on the other hand, happens the rest of the time. 
when the weather is not great, when it's foggy or cold or windy or raining and the fisher can't see the fish in the water, so they just cast in different directions, blind. It's not a super method of super popular method of fly fishing, as you might imagine. Most people want to see where we're throwing a line in. We want to know what we're doing. We want to know where to cast that line for the most profitable result. And not just in fishing. Even in ministry, we prefer sight casting. And most of the time, that's for the right reasons. We don't want to waste resources. We don't want to waste time or energy or money just casting blind. We want to know what we want to know, what we want to know that when we invest, who will be the recipient of our investment? Where will yield the best return? And we like our odds that we can have an assurance when we can see what the results will be. Amen? Except there's this. If we look to the stories in scripture, stories of our faith, most of the people that God calls are not sight casters at all. They cast blind. Abram was one such blind caster. Abram was the wealthy heir of an estate owner. He took the business his family founded and he grew it larger and more lucrative than anybody could have thought possible. In the community, oh, upstanding, a pillar of the community. He owned land, he owned livestock, servants, had a number of concubines, even took care of his wayward nephew, Lot. He and his wife, Sarai, had everything except children. And at 75, well, who cared anymore? So when God stepped in and asked Abram to go, and for the record, that's the only call Abram got, by the way, and that's the only direction Abram got. Go, leave your country, God says, get out of your father's house, get out of your homeland, take your family and take all your stuff and go to a land that I will show you. Abram, in fact, was asked to blind cast and probably for the first time in his life. He was a smart and savvy business owner. He built wealth by acquiring what he could see, those extra 100 acres over there of fertile land, another 40 sheep that aren't, don't have any spots, and maybe two or three more concubines. All of this was based on him knowing where his resources would go. This call, this invitation from God had to be so far out of the box for Abram to go to a land that I will show you, not that you can see, not that somebody's told you about, go to a land that I will show you. Cast blind, Abram, and I'll be with you. What this tells us is something about how strong that calling must have felt to Abram. To have his life upended like that. He had no background that we know of of hearing voices. He had no background of a religious tradition, even a faith that we know of. In fact, the last mention of God before this story of Abram was nine generations before. And if you do biblical math, that's thousands of years because everybody lived to three, four, five hundred years old. Imagine this call. Abram must have seemed like he was losing it to his wife, to his friends, to his community, to his employees, when he told them that they were moving. Um, not, uh, no, I don't actually know to quite where, but pack up everybody, because I think we're going fishing. <laughs> this would not be the only time in Abram's life that he would blind cast. For the next 15 years, dragging his family and servants and livestock and stuff, he would go from place to place as God directed, 
and always met something that he didn't anticipate. Things rarely turned out as he hoped. Each time God would communicate something and then remind Abram that they were in covenant together and the covenant was based on something unbreakable and that promise to be with Abram, to bless him, to make him a great nation, to make his descendants as numerous as the stars, to give he and Sarah a child who would then carry on that covenant for generations. Now, one would think that if God were to choose someone to com completely change the course of human history, which Abram did, to start this movement of peace and justice and reconciliation among the nations, which Abram did, that God would choose someone that was upright, blameless, perfect, but that's not a description of Abram at all. Abram was far from perfect. He made his share of mistakes. He lied for his own security more than once. He tried to manipulate God more than once. He tried to shame God even into doing what he wanted. He even fathered a child with his wife's maid because God wasn't getting around to giving him a child fast enough. I think it's important that we name that because too often we think that we're not able to do what God calls us to do because our lives are so far from perfect. Amen? Except God doesn't call the perfect. God perfects the called. As we journey with God, we begin to shed off those things that trip us up and slowly embrace how God sees us. Because honestly, any other way, if we focus on our, in, our, on our imperfections, if we po focus on our misbehaviors, on, if we focus on all of the ways we fall short, you know what we end up with? First, we end up not doing anything except confessing, 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 and thinking that we're messed up. The second thing that we do is we end up with a very self-centered, individualistic kind of faith. Our journey with God becomes about us, and not about the other, and not about God. It becomes about changing ourselves instead of changing the world. So Abram... As he journeyed with God, he missed the mark so many times. And that brings us to today's text. And we get to listen in on one of the many conversations between God and Abram about covenant. It's not their first, and it's far from their last. But this time, God introduces God's self with a brand new name. What we translate in English as here I am, God Almighty, means in Hebrew, here I am, the many-breasted one. And this is so beautiful. It, not because, yes, feminists in the room, God also has a feminine identity. It's beautiful because God gave Abram a deeper look, a wider glimpse of who God is just when Abram needed it the most. And at 99 years old, Abram needed to see God as someone who could renew two seemingly dried up old individuals to the softness and suppleness of a young newlywed couple. Abram needed to see God as one who could give them him and his wife, all of the excitement of expectant parents, that there would be plenty of milk for their babies, that their children would be fed, that they would be nurtured, that they would grow into loving, responsible adults. So God announces this new name, many-breasted one, and God becomes to Abram more than Abram imagined. 
a God who breaks boundaries of human biology and possibility that God is working in Abram's present situation right now, that God, no matter what, keeps God's promises, no matter how impossible and dried up we might seem, even giving him a child at 99. But God knows this too, that for Abram to accept this part of God's self, to be able to see God in a different, new, broader, richer, deeper way, Abram also will have to see himself in a different way. So God changes Abram's name. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. Abram Abraham will be your new identity. Now to you or I, maybe this isn't such a big deal, a name change. To some of us, it's a very big deal whose identity is wrapped up in name. Amen? But this is no easy ask for Abram. He knows Abram. He knows Abram's gifts, Abram's skills, Abram's vocation, Abram's purpose in life. He knows Abram's role in the, in the community and as master of the house. Abraham. The thing is that through the years, Abram had become a sightcaster. Yeah, he saw his role clearly. He saw it in community. He saw his role in politics. He saw his role in activism. He saw his role as master of the house. He saw what causes to take up and what causes to leave to others. He was secure in God being God and Abram being Abram. Sounds safe, doesn't it? But God is asking Abram once again to go to a land that I will show you, to blind cast at 99, believe what you cannot see, adopt this new identity as father of many nations, even though you still lack a promised child. And to help Abram with this new identity, God gives him an H. Actually, it's an H-A, but there's no vowels in Hebrew, so it's really an H. And he gives an H to Sarah as well. She becomes from Sarai to Sarah. The significance to us might seem small, but the, le the letter H in Hebrew, does anyone know? It means spirit, breath, wind. Abram, now Abraham, carries with him in his very name the spirit of God. Every time he hears his new name spoken, he will be reminded of that spirit that fills his soul, affirmed that he also has part of the wind of creation within him, and he, too, can breathe the breath of new life. I wonder today how might our perception of God have to change in order for us to embrace that we are not who we think we are, not who we've been accustomed to be, safe with God being God and us being who we know ourselves to be. I wonder what truths we hold about God that we might need to be, to just leave behind in order for us to walk forward with God into an unknown future with an identity that God gives us. What will it take for us to see God making a covenant with us, calling us to go to a place that I will show you, to become blind casters ourselves, to step out in faith, to be fishers of people. Might begin, and it's just a fun illustration, it might begin with us learning to live with an H in our name to realize that the spirit of the living God is always with us, that the wind of God creating always in us, the breath of God continually bringing new life to us. That name that reminds you continually of the spirit of God dwelling in us, that we are loved unconditionally, accepted just the way we are, holy, righteous, 
called. So I thought it might be fun to take an opportunity to try that out. How would it feel to live with an H in your name? Those of you who, for, to whom perhaps this sounds familiar, we have a quilt here, and this quilt hangs usually on the wall up here. It was sewn together by one of our congregants, Elaine Mallon. Elaine, if you're watching, thank you again for this beautiful quilt. Uh, but what we did is many of us, when we had this passage years ago, wrote our names and we put an H somewhere in our name to affirm the spirit that lives within us. If you were not here during that, that, that exercise and you'd like to try that out today, I invite you to come up, sign the quilt. There's plot, lots of pens here. You can put your name. It doesn't have to be in your own square. It can be in somebody else's square. It can be on the purple. It can be anywhere you want. Put an H in your name. If you've done this already and your name is already up here, let me invite you to come and write over it and affirm who you are. Again, we're starting this new year out fresh, remembering who we're called to be, what we're called to do, and this spirit that lies in us. So let's come together and uh, write as we're able. Renew and, re and work. Affirm.